Welcome back to my channel, YouTube. Listen, I'm so happy you're here. We just rolled this whole series out. So for all of my new subscribers, I'm so glad you decided to subscribe to my channel. And I promise you, I am gonna bring the most value possible. We are gonna hop right in. Today, we are talking about fruit and vegetable identification. Along with that, we're gonna add in herbs. This is going to be a class, like straight up, I'm reading directly from the textbook. I truly believe that the ninth edition of The Professional Chef is a wonderful frame of reference and it's factual and we're not just going off of my voice alone. With that being said, yes, I do recommend you buy the book, but no, you do not have to. I'm leaving a downloadable PDF down in the description below and I highly recommend you download it and follow along. Let's get right into it. We're starting on page 128, General Guidelines. Now, I pulled some bits and pieces from this chapter. I wanna give you the cliff notes. I highly recommend you go back and do more research. If there is a certain fruit or vegetable that sticks out to you or you wanna know more information about, Google it, okay? This section is gonna be geared more towards a professional chef career, but at the same time, an avid home cook or somebody that cooks at home for the family could take this as well. General guidelines for fruits, vegetables, and herbs. They should be in good condition, though what constitutes a favorable appearance varies from one item to another. In general, fruits and vegetables should be free of bruises, mold, brown or soft spots, and pest damage. They should have colors and textures appropriate to their type, and any attached leaves should not be wilted. Fruits should be plump, not shriveled. Specific information on particular types of produce is given in the sections below. When you are picking fruits and vegetables for a restaurant that you're gonna serve to other people, make sure your standards are high, okay? When I was a chef, I literally sent stuff back that just looked at me wrong. Don't even bring it. Just say it's not available. If you're at home and you have your own garden, right, and you have a couple bruised tomatoes or let's say a bug got into it, yeah, cut that part off and go and roll with it. If you are a professional chef and you're a receiving product, it has to be at a certain standard. There have been times where I have a banquet operation and I've received a case of apples. If two or three are bruised or they don't look right, are you gonna send the whole case back? No, just ask them to give you a credit of, you know, X amount of dollars and call it even. So I don't mean be that like crazy about your produce, but you need to set the standard high. Also, keep in mind, if you are working with a local farmers, remember farmers have a different mindset of fruits and vegetables. What doesn't look perfect to you might look perfect and taste great to them. And I just urge everybody to use your best judgment on when to drop the hammer. I had this one farmer, best lettuce ever in Los Angeles at the Santa Monica's Farmer's Market. It tastes so good, but the problem was, it was so dirty all the time, ridiculous dirty. Yes, I wanted to use the lettuce and I really loved the lettuce, but guess what? It just took so long to clean. It was just a logistical nightmare. And I'm sorry, but if a guest gets one grain of sand or one grain of dirt in their salad, it ruins their experience. Ultimately, I had to give that farmer feedback. That was a very hard conversation. Here we have this little old lady that she's been farming a whole life and farmers will eat stuff straight off the field. But when you're at a higher end restaurant or hotel, you cannot do that. Just keep that in consideration when you are procuring your fruits and vegetables. Availability and seasonality. Prior to the increased agricultural production and distribution technology, chefs were limited to locally grown seasonal fruits and vegetables. Through food establishments are no longer bound to buy local produce. It's still a favorable practice if and when possible. It is important to support the local growers. Moreover, so-called boutique farmers may have specialty products such as wild lettuces, golden beets, and yellow tomatoes that is not available through large commercial purveyors. Another advantage to buying local is that the flavor and condition of the foods are often superior. Locally grown sweet corn, apricots, peaches, and strawberries that have not been shipped are just a few examples. Conversely, there are items that are shipped particularly well. Examples include asparagus, head lettuces, broccoli, apples, and citrus fruits. The issue that I run into with as a professional chef and running a restaurant is consistency with seasonality, the farmers, and what they have available. I mean, you could get a downpour that completely wipes the crop and then you have to take it off the menu for the next week. So what I really recommend is find a vendor that is very flexible and have 80% of your menu of items that you can keep in stock to keep that flow going. Unless you have a fine dining restaurant and you're able to change the menu every single day to what's in season, then I would recommend do what you want. But sometimes people come to the restaurant because they want consistency. They want that same product every single time. So 
I just make sure I'm extra careful with anything that is seasonal. Here in California, listen, we have long seasons. If one farmer doesn't have one thing, I can get it from another farmer. We're very lucky and very fortunate, but I can't say that's for anything else. A good example is like Harry's Berry strawberries. They are absolutely delicious. They're like a prized possession. They're super expensive, but they don't have them all year round. There are some gaps in the season. And sometimes it's really hard to explain to your clientele that, but at the same time, people are starting to ask where and when their food was produced. And this is becoming more prevalent. And a lot of people are understanding to not having something that's out of season. So keep that in mind. Next, storage. Once the produce has been received, following certain storage guidelines can ensure that its quality remains. Most food service establishments store produce for no more than three to four days. Although the length of storage depends on the business's volume, the available storage facilities and delivery frequency. It is ideal to let the purveyor handle the produce as long as possible. To help ensure you use the freshest product possible and not overload your valuable storage space. Obviously, we're gonna get into a few exceptions, but I think this is really important to listen up if you are a professional chef or if you're a kitchen manager. With a few exceptions, bananas, tomatoes, potatoes, dried onions, ripe fruits and vegetables should be refrigerated unless otherwise specified. Produce should be kept at a temperature of 40 to 45 to 7 degrees Celsius with a relative humidity of 80 to 90 percent. The ideal situation is to have a separate walk-in or reach-in refrigerator for fruits and vegetables. Most fruits and vegetables should be kept dry because excess moisture can promote spoilage. Therefore, most produce should not be peeled, washed, or trimmed until just before use. The outer leaves of the lettuce, for example, should be left intact. Carrots should remain unpeeled. The exceptions to this rule are the leafy tops on root vegetables such as beets, turnips, carrots, and radishes. They should be removed and either discarded or used immediately because after their harvesting, the leaves absorb nutrients from the root and increase moisture lost. Fruits and vegetables that need further ripening, notably peach Peaches and avocados should be stored at room temperature 65 to 70 degrees. Once the produce is ripe, it should be refrigerated so that it does not become overripe. Most restaurants that I've worked in that are at a large volume, we have one fridge for the butcher shop, one fridge for the vegetables and produce because they're highly perishable. And I think what's really important is by the time it gets to you, it's been handled quite a bit. You make sure that the vendor, the driver, the farmer, they are all on the same page with you as far as packing and delivering. That is the biggest thing. And then once you get it and you receive it, you take care of it from start to finish, from top to bottom. That's why I always recommend whenever a delivery comes in, everything gets put, packed away right away, stored, neat and organized. Or else, guess what? The quality just sacrifices after that. So keep that in mind. Fun fact about fruits, and then we're gonna move on to a few pictures. Fruits. Fruits are the ovaries that surround or contain the seeds of the plants. Customarily used in sweet dishes, fruits are also excellent with savory items, such as potato lattes and grilled pork chops. Fruit is wonderful, served alone as a refreshing breakfast or a finale to a meal. Dried fruits find their way into compotes, stuffings, and sauces. Fun fact. Did you know avocados are a fruit? Did you know eggplant is considered a fruit? And tomatoes are considered a fruit. Vegetables. Vegetables are roots, tubers, stems, leaves, and leaf stalks, seeds, seed pods, and flower heads of plants that may be safely eaten. Vegetables commonly include a number of foods that are biotanically classified as fruits, such as tomatoes. Their culinary application is guiding principle for placing them in this section rather than the previous one right? It's controversial. That's why I said it. I love to like trick people with that, but it technically scientifically is true. Next, herbs. Herbs are the leaves of aromatic plants used primarily to add flavor to foods. Aroma is a good indicator of quality in both fresh and dried herbs. They should have even color, healthy looking leaves and stems, no wilting, brown spots, sunburn or pest damage. Fresh herbs should be minced or cut in chiffonade as close to service time as possible. They are usually added to a dish towards the end of cooking time. For uncooked preparations, fresh herbs should be added well in advance of serving. In general, herbs should be stored loosely wrapped in a damp paper towel and refrigerated. If desired, place the wrapped herbs in plastic bags to help retain moisture and reduce wilting and discoloration of leaves. It is a good idea to label the herbs so that they are easy to locate. I made a video on this. I'll try to find it and post it down below, but my whole career as a chef, I've always been told use fresh herbs, use fresh herbs versus dry herbs. I think they're two different applications and I would argue that dried herbs have a place in the culinary world and I treat dried herbs as spices opposed to 
fresh herbs, right? And there are some applications that I think dried herbs arguably are better, like sausages. I never put fresh herbs in sausage ever again. I always put dry herbs. Meatloaf is another good one. You know, sauces, any type of salsa. There's so many things you can use dry herbs for over fresh. I would argue that I think dry herbs are equally as important as fresh herbs. Now, if you're going to finish a sauce, if you're going to, you know, make a salad, if you're going to finish some type of cold dish, then yes, fresh herbs make more sense. But I want everybody to start thinking if somebody tells you, oh, fresh herbs over dry herbs, because that was what's sold to me, not necessarily, and it's highly debatable. So if you got value from this video, hit that like button, smash the subscribe, okay? Turn on the post notifications, you already know the drill, and share this with somebody that needs to see it. Thanks a lot, see you next week.